All right. Let's get this out of the way first. The thoughts, views, and opinions expressed on Tailboard Talks Firefighter Podcast are solely those of the speakers, guests, and host, and do not in any way represent the thoughts or views or opinions of any other employer, partnership, or sponsor. The material and information in this podcast is for general information purposes only and should be used at the listener's discretion. Here comes the intro. Skip forward 30 seconds if you want to get right to the episode. This is the Tailboard Talk Podcast, the best health, wellness, and lifestyle resource for the fire service. We're using stories, lessons, and tips from the front lines to give a realistic view of what the job can do to us and how we can make it out alive. I'm Chris Morella, a firefighter since 03, medic since 05, full-time since 08, and promoted to lieutenant in 20. I'm also a personal trainer and strength coach, and I'm here to give you the best information and host the best discussions to make us capable and durable, both on the job and away from it. So grab a heater, steal some fancy creamer from First Shift, and let's go chat. Well, you, you have a different topic for for the first responder conferences thing. You have a different topic than what we saw you for. So what's the topic for that one? Um, you know, I'm still kind of flushing out the exact topic, okay. um, but or title rather. But uh, the topic is going to be focused on the ways that childhood trauma or adverse experiences in childhood may be impacting responders currently, whether that's by way of like a critical incident and then they're confused about their reactions on scene, or maybe it's parenting, um, but kind of looking at trauma, but not in the usual sense of occupational trauma. Okay. So kind of helping people to understand that our childhoods play a part in who we are today and how we process things today in adulthood. Well, that sounds very scary. What do you mean? Why does it sound scary? <laughs> it sounds like a scary conversation. So last, the last episode I, did, I talked with uh, Tim Sears, who's also presenting. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I think he's on the 15th. Do you know him? Or have you met him? I do know Tim. Yes. So he brought, he brought that up of like, uh, one of the guys who helped him through his PTSD and his, his ongoing treatment is, said that 80% of first responders come from a dysfunctional household of some sort, you know? And I think immediately I was like, ah, oh, crap. Now I got to think about that. Like, do, do I like this job because something terrible happened to me that I don't want to think about again, that I haven't really mm-hmm. been cognizant of, you know? So I think it's just scary of pointing that out of like, hey, here's another way uh, you might be potentially screwed up that you didn't think about that's also an emotional roller coaster enjoy yeah i i can understand what you're saying or or why you might may think that it is a scary topic but based on the research um, of that they conducted um when they did the ace study which is the adverse childhood experiences study um about 61 percent or exactly 61 percent of adults surveyed across 25 states have at least one adverse childhood experience and about one in six have four or more. So it's pretty common. It's not just first responders. It's most of us uh, have experienced an adverse childhood experience. So what would that, what's that defined as what's an adverse childhood experience? So it would be experiencing Violence, abuse, or neglect, uh, witnessing violence in your home or community, having a family member that attempts or dies by suicide, witnessing a substance use problem or a mental health problem in a caregiver or primary parent, and then having a parent that was either incarcerated or parents that were divorced or separated. That's a large category. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of stuff that goes into that. So that, that makes more sense then. I prefer to think of that broad general definition when I think of it. I think a lot of my, I don't want to say fear, hesitancy to look at that stuff is like, I don't want to think that critically about um, my childhood. Like I have a pretty pretty positive image of my childhood when I look back at it. Like I don't want to spoil it by thinking about terrible things that may impact me today. Can't we just focus on like fixing the stuff now? But I guess that's like an impossible approach right yeah it's kind of like chicken or the egg i think um you know if we are all a accumulation of the experiences that we go through from the time that we are born till today 
So it's hard to say, let's just focus on what's happening now in the present, because most oftentimes it can be connected back to something in early adulthood or adolescence or childhood. And maybe it's even several experiences combined that are now creating symptomology or, or present ways of being that you're looking at changing. Yeah. So how far back do I really have to go? Can I just know that at a certain point, can I, I guess it's up to the individual. Can I know that like, okay, obviously something happened in my childhood that's making me act this way now. Is it really that important to determine exactly what that was? Or can I just know that and then try to make changes going forward? Well, I think it depends on the individual. Um, I would say that in, in certain situations, probably is not as important as, you know, really dissecting a situation and knowing that, you know, there's no resolution, can't change the past. It is what it is. Let's acknowledge it and move on. I think there's validity to that. But I also think in other situations, specifically with first responders, and this is something that we see at the Center of Excellence, that connecting those dots, usually around child abuse, does help them to understand, okay, this is why when I respond to these types of calls or when my kids behave in a certain way or I see children behaving or acting in a specific way, I have this response. Sometimes that can be really powerful for that person and help them to better understand themselves and maybe give themselves some grace for choices that maybe happened as a result of those situations. Sure. Um, so I, I think you naturally, we, we kind of jumped into it and I think that was a great introduction, but <laughs> I think there's probably people that don't, that didn't listen to your first one or weren't around for your first one or just um, aren't putting it together who you are. So why don't you just do a quick intro um, about who you are, who you work for, and then how you're uh, working with the center of excellence. And we'll kind of, we'll jump back into it after that. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I'm Molly Jones. I'm a licensed social worker and clinical outreach coordinator for advanced recovery systems and advanced recovery systems is a behavioral health treatment company that has substance use and mental health facilities all across the United States. And they partnered with the International Association of Firefighters, otherwise known as the IFF, to build the Center of Excellence in Upper Marlboro, Maryland in 2017. And that program is exclusive to active and retired members of the IAFF. And we, as the clinical outreach team or a member of the outreach team, we assist those men and women in getting into facilities like the Center of Excellence or other treatment centers across the country that specialize in working with first responders. We also connect responders to and their families to outpatient providers in their local communities. So we do a lot of vetting across the country and, and know a lot about the resources that are available across North America. We have a webinar series too, where we focus on behavioral health topics that are pertinent to fire service members and other first responders, treatment providers, family members to push the ball forward in terms of education and awareness around behavioral health, both related to the occupation of public safety and also just because we're human beings and deal with stress and life and how we can better manage those sorts of things. So that's what I do. That was an awesome intro. <laughs> not well, the first, not the first time, right? You had that no, locked down. Not, uh, definitely not the first time I've had to explain who I am and what I do. How's the, uh, how's the webinars going? Cause those were hot and heavy. Are they still kind of going in a regular clip or are they kind of, um, are you trading that more in for public for in-person stuff now? So we are still providing webinars twice a month. One of those every other month is a reoccurring presentation on cultural competency in the fire service. It's really meant for treatment providers to learn more about the basics of the fire service and the culture of the fire service so they can maybe be better equipped to help fire service members that might be seeking 
treatment with them or better recognize maybe deficits in their understanding of this population. Um, so that one is one that's reoccurring that we will probably continue to do indefinitely. And then on the off months of that and that other presentation each month, we're covering a new topic. So we have a wide array of webinars that we have completed since May of 2020, and those are all archived on our website. Um, so we're still doing that, but yes, we are also prioritizing in-person education. So we offer education at no cost to first responder departments and other interested groups all across the country and really focus on what we've learned through our treatment at the Center of Excellence and maybe even some of these other first responder programs that we've started in recent years. Um, we go to conferences, set up trainings with departments or peer teams, locals, anyone that's interested in really talking with us. So there's no shortage of events that we are lined up um, to speak at or even host on our own. Yeah. And then you and I are both presenting um, at the First Responders Conference in South Bend in uh, on May 15th and 16th. So that's kind of, I've had a nice string of presenters through there. I think you're the fourth one from that. So I hope everybody's uh, kind of looking into that or anybody's interested is looking at the South Bend one. Um, and I'll put all this stuff in the notes as well as anything Molly wants to push out to you guys. So I don't mean to deviate for too long, but I am interested in the cultural competence um, webinar stuff because I think that's a that's a major falling down point of a lot of people that come into any fire station or any fire department and want to teach stuff. We've had several either chiropractors, wellness groups, um, mostly those two, come in and try to get in to give a presentation in the fire department. And what they eventually want to do is have you go to their clinic, right? They want you to go to their, um, their low T clinic or their chiropractor thing or whatever. But when they give their presentation, it, they fall down immediately because they either have to ask questions about like, well, when do you guys get off work tonight or tomorrow? And immediately their credibility is shot because they don't, it's clear that they're just giving a generalized presentation. They don't actually know what we're dealing with. Um, or a number of other things come up where, the, the, you know, it just falls flat. So what kind of things are you just, um, what are the main bullet points or what are the, some of the big takeaways that you give out during that cultural competency one? So cultural competency, we start with the basic or not basic, I'd say common is the better word, common behavioral health challenges faced by fire service members. So we talk about depression, anxiety, PTSD, substance use, suicidality. We touch on stress and sleep dysregulation too, but we really spend more time on uh, those diagnosable conditions that we see most oftentimes at the center of excellence and talk about the prevalence of those, how and why fire service members may struggle with those conditions at a higher rate in comparison to the general population or maybe even other types of first responders as well. We talk about different treatment modalities and approaches to helping with those conditions as well. Things that we have found as being most successful in our work at the Center of Excellence and then some other evidence-based kind of research to support those interventions or modalities that we recommend. Then we talk about the basics of the fire service. So shift work, um, the structure and, and order and, and clear channels as far as communication and procedures and protocols go talk about the culture to, um, you know, basic personality characteristics that are seen most frequently, why people may be drawn to this job, why, you know, not only are they drawn to it, but find themselves successful in it. Um, talk about stigmas and just ways of interacting with one another to then help providers better understand how they can tailor their approach and treatment with first responders to build rapport, have higher levels of engagement. Um, and usually that is centered around let's play on that rank structure and order that's so prevalent in this occupation. Let's play on some of these personality traits and characteristics just to help them to better understand or to, to feel 
better supported in treatment. And then we'll talk to about lingo and presentation. So the provider better understands that client too, just to kind of bridge the gaps. Awesome. So how, how many, uh, what's the average person that, that goes to that or attends that? What's their, um, what are they doing? Like, is it a lot of counselors or therapists or is it across the board different? Is it every kind of professional that wants to get in or who's, who's usually taking you up on those offers for those presentations? Well, it's open to anyone. Uh, so we'll see kind of a mixed bag. A lot of firefighters attend. Hmm. Uh, and I think many of them find helpful information in the behavioral health awareness portion of it. And then uh, we'll see a good amount of treatment providers who are attending. Usually it's kind of a mixed bag there too on if they already have the first responder expertise or background. Sometimes it's people who are completely new to the profession or to helping the population. Other times it's people that are more seasoned. We'll see chaplains, administration uh, within the fire department and the city or municipality even handful of spouses, members of the community that just maybe find their way to the webinar and, and might not have any affiliation to the first responder community. So it's kind of a mixed group. That's pretty cool. I didn't, I, you know, I really didn't think that, that it would be attended by many firefighters. That's not, um, cause you think they would be like, yeah, you should learn this stuff about how to talk to me, not necessarily going to see what the culture is and how to be competent in it. But I guess it makes sense that it's just a broad array of information. And, um, it's like an, it's like a way to look at the problem, but not really look at the problem. So it makes sense for a lot of guys I know that would take that approach. Um, how about this right off the top of your head? Is there some, like, if I was going to go seek out a, a clinician of some sort for my mental health, are there certain, uh, words or, um, titles or anything that I should look for that would clue me in to be like, oh, this person has the ability and the knowledge to, to treat me as a firefighter, first responder, not just as a person in the general public. Like I know there's, it's the, you guys have more letters after your name than doctors, all different sorts of combinations of them in the, in the mental health world. What are some ones that I can look at quickly and easily and be like, okay, I know this person has these four letters after the name. That means that they can work with firefighters well. I wish that there was a good answer to that question or a concise answer to that question, because unfortunately it is going to take time and vetting to ensure that whoever you are connecting with is equipped or appropriate, um, for first responders. Um, there are some different programs out there that people will put letters after their names, like a certified first responder counselor. And, you know, the, I think they're very well-meaning people um, and providers, but until you get them on the phone and ask questions around their education and experience and really can feel them out as just a person, I don't feel like you're going to have a good pulse on if they are suitable for first responders or not, because anyone can go on to psychology today or some other web-based platform or directory and say, yeah, I treat first responders, but maybe they've just taken a class or maybe they've um, just decided that that's a population that they want to work with, or maybe their dad was a firefighter. And so now they believe that they have that understanding and education to be effective. So I think it's more important to get them on the phone and really have a conversation on their expertise and knowledge and background. We do a lot of that. Um, so we have a database of clinicians that's probably, if not over 2000, very close to that number of people that our team has personally vetted. And what that means is we've either met with them in person or talked with them via Zoom or another virtual platform and have kind of put them through the ringer in terms of finding out exactly who they are, what they do, what their background is, how long they've been doing it. So have some very specific parameters around who gets on our vetted list. We share those names with people that reach out to us and are curious of who they're in 
who's in their local community. But um, I think it's really important that if someone's going to take on that task or that responsibility that you're looking for someone who not only has engaged in, let's say, a, a certified first responder counselor program, gone through the IFF's clinician awareness course, taken a, a fire ops training, done ride alongs, has been working with first responders for three to five years, um, is really knowledgeable and skilled in treating trauma. Um, so there's some pretty specific things that I would be looking for. Hmm. So, and that's, that's advanced recovery systems. They do that, right? Yes, we do do that. Okay. So that's not the center of excellence. This is where, this is where the lines always get blurred in my head of like, you represent and you work so closely with the center of excellence, but advanced recovery systems does the vetting and the listing and has all those resources. No, it's okay. It does. It does get confusing and can be hard to figure out who's who. A lot of people think we work for the IFF, right. but we don't. We just work in collaboration with them through a partnership. All right. So let's get back to um, your presentation on the – let's get back to your presentation in South Bend. Let's just say it like okay. that. <laughs> um, uh, so get, you already gave me the overview of it. Where – is this a new presentation for you? Are you developing this one – recently or has this been around for a little bit as one of your offerings no so this is a brand new presentation cool and that kind of gives me a little anxiety but <laughs> um i think it's important to think about you know i i think at this point in the first responder behavioral awareness behavioral health awareness space first responders know that they're dying by suicide at a higher rate. They know that PTSD is a problem. They know that substance use is how we cope um, or how they cope. But um, why is that? Why, why is it that some first responders struggle more with trauma than others? And I think some of that comes down to these experiences in our childhood or adolescence that we haven't processed or maybe we've re buried them so far deep that we don't even remember that they happened. Um, so it's all meant to really give the first responders a little bit more insight maybe into themselves. But being that I do a lot of work with peer support teams, I think it's helpful for a peer support team member to think about whoever they may be helping in terms of not just the occupation and what's going on, but really widening that lens and thinking about this person might be struggling with that mom's response to their child being hurt or in danger in this really strange way because their parent was neglectful of them. Um, so I think it can just help give everyone a little bit more clarity on their own responses as well as the responses of their peers that they may be helping to. So where, where was this presentation born from? Like, is this something that you um, have recently kind of connected the dots on and you think it's really, really important? Or is this something that you've beaten your head against the wall trying to explain it individually for a long time? And now you're like, I'm just going to, I'm just going to put something together that can just blanket this whole thing and guys can take it back and, and do what they want with it. Um, I'm not really sure that there was any, place that it was born from or experience that it was born out of. But when I think about conferences and bringing something new to the table, just kind of reiterating that I think a lot of first responders struggle with um, the fact that they may came, have come from neglectful or abusive homes, and maybe that's why they were drawn to this type of profession. We see it all the time at the Center of Excellence, probably half maybe of our clients, and I'm just estimating, have some of these adverse experiences, if not more of them. Um, and they're just now learning in treatment that this is part of my problem or part of what I'm experiencing. So having known that for several years, and I think that's a, a reason that I think that this topic was helpful or one that I wanted to pursue. 
I also think that it's really important from that peer support place or perspective to start widening that lens of what's wrong with this person or moving away from what's wrong with this person and really expanding upon what has this person experienced. Um, it can give us more empathy and understanding. Um, and I think it also helps us to show up in a more kind of humble way. So thinking about the fact that lots of peer supporters attend these first responder conferences, that would be helpful for them and maybe something out of the norm of what they typically learn. So really, I think it was born out of my own need to be creative. <laughs> I mean, it's very, I like it a lot. I think it's, it's super um, creative. I mean, it's something that when I was talking to Tim after we stopped recording, um, we kind of talked about just the redundancy of some uh, conferences where it's like, so I just went to a, a health and wellness one a couple months ago and pretty much every speaker had the same list of modifiable risk factors for cancer or depression or whatever. Right. And it was like, okay, here's another person telling me that, um, keeping my weight in a healthy range and drinking enough water and getting enough sleep is good for me. And I'll be less likely to get whatever malady they're talking about. So after the, you know, the fourth or fifth one, you're like, okay, let's get something else going on here. And the mm -hmm. topic is good, but it all comes back to the same kind of root things for majority of wellness solutions. Right. So I think it's pretty cool. I'm, I'm scared of it, like I said before, but I'm, I'm excited to hear about it because, um, I think it's just, it's another angle. It's another thing that guys can look at and use, uh, bring back to the department and, you know, as well as they can educate or at least make it a thing so people can do their own education on it. Uh, but I think it's going to be pretty awesome. So what, when you were making it, when you were building the presentation, was there any one part that you, we're kind of in the middle of, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a really cool portion of this thing. Like, I'm really looking forward to hitting this point of the presentation. Not necessarily. You know, I think just being that it's a topic that's kind of out of the norm, I'm excited about all of it. But, you know, what this ACE study found was the higher the number of these adverse experiences that a child has been exposed to, the greater the likelihood that they will have adverse health outcomes so in adulthood. So things like cancer, diabetes, heart disease, um, early pregnancies, poor relationship skills. I mean, there's so many uh, adverse health outcomes in adulthood that can be tied back to our childhood. I think that that is another dot connector maybe for people and I kind of fall under the thinking of knowledge is power and if I know that because I had five or six aces in my childhood that I am now going to be at greater risk for developing cancer and I'm a firefighter and I also use nicotine products there are some things that I can maybe do there to reduce some of that risk and maybe prevent some of that from happening. But I wouldn't otherwise know that that risk was so much greater for myself if I didn't have this information about these adverse childhood experiences. So I, you know, there's some aspects of the fire service or the first responder world that you can't avoid like cumulative trauma exposure or exposure to carcinogens, but you know, you can take your, annual screenings very seriously or, you know, refrain from using nicotine products or engage in smoking cessation or, you know, take other protective measures to help yourself. And I just feel like if you didn't have some of this background information on why it's important, you might not feel drawn to engaging in those protective measures, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I'm interested in, as you're talking, explain it even more so because it doesn't feel like piling on. I think a lot of times um, whenever something new comes out or someone has a speaking point, it feels like piling on to why our job is going to kill us. Right. It's like and I think the most recent one was like the, the PFAS in the gear where it's just this unavoidable thing. And now mm -hmm. your gear is going to give you cancer as well, which is extremely valid, like 
concern and the science is there to say that it is a valid concern. But it's like, God, can we just get a break from this thing, you know? This doesn't feel like that, though, where it's like just one more thing that's going to kill you. It feels like, hey, this is something that you should probably pay attention to because it can help you. Um, it can help you in your responses and your health in the future instead of just saying, here's this unavoidable thing. Enjoy. Uh, we're working on it. So I, I think it takes a different approach. and It's a different set of education coming at us in this one that um, it doesn't feel like one more condemnation because of the job we chose. Right. And from a mental health perspective, I think, too, it might take some of that personal responsibility off of that responder if they're able to understand and know that, hey, these things that happened in my childhood that I had no control or say over is now making it more difficult for me to do my job because I really struggle with child related calls or calls that trigger some experience that I went through in childhood kind of makes it a little bit easier and take some of that pressure off of maybe it's not entirely my fault or there's something inherently wrong with me, but it's this experience that I was a part of that I had no say or control over, which I think can be powerful. Um, and I also like to think too, in terms of your own child rearing, if you know that these adverse experiences are going to or potentially be detrimental to your own kid as they grow up, co-parenting really successful or make it that even though maybe you and your spouse are separated or going through a divorce, you're going to ensure that there is quality family time spent as a unit because we know that if we don't do that, then X, Y, or Z may be more likely for my own kids. So I think it can be powerful in a lot of different ways. Yeah, I mean, it fits right. Well, it fits into the model of the first responder because that's what you just described. Essentially, it was every call we go on. Here's something that I had no involvement with that happened that the people within it usually don't have control over, and I'm going to show up and make it better, right? Um, that puts the same lens as what you just talked about. Here's this event that happened back then that I had no control over, and uh, here I am showing up, and I was an adult now, and I can choose to make it better. It feels very similar to what we do every day on shift. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of it in that way. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that that's in line with that as well. I mean, there's so much unpredictability and, and uncertainty in your jobs. Yeah. Um, well, I think it's going to be awesome. I just want to share a quick, I can't remember if we talked to you about this or not, when you presented in my department um, and you brought up the relationship scales just in the, the last little summary you did, in the last little explanation you did. And there was a funny moment during that because I can't remember what this, the scale was, but essentially you said, here's here's 20 things or 30 things. Maybe you, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about when we get into it. Here's 20 things, and I want you to answer yes or no or mm-hmm. agree or disagree. I, does, is it already making sense what I'm, at, what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. And uh, how many? so how many is it? It's 20. Okay. And we're going through it, and, uh, you know, the, they were relatively – um, I can't remember the format of the questions. Even it was like, do you hate your spouse or something like that? Like it was something very broad, but also pretty relevant. And I remember marking like, yes, 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 no. A couple more yeses and no. A couple more yeses and no. And I'm like, oh man, that's three. This would be pretty rough. And Katie was like, I got four. And we're like sweating of like, what's the grade going to be on this thing? And you're like, okay. So if you got 10 or more, and we're like, 10? Like who gets ten? Not to not to damn anybody that gets ten or more, but it was such a funny moment because we thought at like three or four we were screwed, and you're like, no, you guys are fine. Like that's totally normal. And one of the conversations that Katie and I had was like, you could be up to seven on any given day, and then come back down to two the next day, especially when we had the new kids, the new babies, um, and even more so now that I think about it, the Nathan's four. Uh, there's hours of the day where it's a nine or a 12. And then most of the time it's like a one or a two, you know? So that was, that was a really funny thing. Maybe you can explain the, the, the relationship screen or test better. Uh, but that was a, a, a funny moment from your presentation you did with us. Yeah, it's a relationship resiliency test and it is not scientific by any means. Um, it is just a self-report kind of, assessment where you either answer yes or no to these 20 questions and it's things like 
I generally like my spouse or <laughs> right. I feel like my spouse usually likes me or, yeah. um, you know, very simple questions. Um, and basically what it says, if you answer 10 or more of these questions with a yes, then you have a, or you reasonably, we could reasonably assume that you have a resilient relationship. If you answer 10 or more of these questions as a no, then it might be likely that your relationship is suffering and has a need for some attention. Um, so it's really just kind of a way to get the wheels sort of turning kind of thing. But to your point of what you shared that you know, on any given day or point in the day, you may answer those questions one way or the other. I think that it is very important to remember that relationships are fluid and our feelings are temporary um, and even kind of bringing it full circle with this talk on these adverse childhood experiences, people are resilient and people can change and grow and it all comes down in my opinion, to communication and taking the initiative. So taking some action when you've identified that these problems have occurred or are occurring. And if you do something about it, then you and or your relationship, if that's what you're looking at, will be better for it. So kind of, I guess, maybe bringing it back to this presentation that I'm going to give I don't want anyone to walk away from any presentation that I deliver thinking like, oh man, I'm really screwed up and there's no hope for me. I would rather people walk away and say, okay, I relate to a lot of that or I recognize some of those things in my own life or across my own development. And because of that, I now know that I have to do something about this. And if I don't do something about this, then whatever it is that I am struggling with, whether it's just some generalized irritability towards other people, or maybe it's something more severe like PTSD related symptoms, those things are only going to intensify and get worse. So I need to do something about it. And that to me is really the whole goal of everything that I do in my work, as well as my whole philosophy around mental health. I think that, and I hope I don't regret saying this or you get mad at me for saying this, but um, I am not one of those people that disagrees with the pull yourself up by the bootstraps mentality. Mm. I think we have to have some of that mentality. I think that we have to be willing to say, I am not going to be a bystander of my own life and I am going to do things. I'm going to take action every single day in every moment or opportunity that I have to make myself and my situation better. And if I don't do that, if I don't pull myself up by my bootstraps, then I am a victim. Um, And then I am a bystander. Uh, Now, of course, I don't think that it's okay to just say, brush it off, get over it, stop being a baby. That's very different than pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. To me, pulling yourself up is all right, we've fallen down, we recognize that there's a problem, there's a need for some intervention, and now I'm going to find out what I need to do or what action I can take to make this better. I think it's a, a 100% true statement. And I, yeah, I, I'm directly in line with that. I think um, uh, there's a lot of people with a lot of really strong opinions on the global social situation um, and the uh, generational differences and blah, 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 blah. Um, but I think that's a, an evergreen kind of lesson, right? Is yeah, sometimes things are going to suck and it doesn't, it's not, it's very easy to say that. And like, yeah, sometimes things suck and you just got to get through it. It's very easy to say that it's very difficult to do it, but unless you do have a little bit of that grit in you to get a grip once in a while and start pushing through or start making the changes. Yeah. You're, you're, then you are truly hopeless, which is a tragedy. Um, Mm -hmm. but until you get to that point, yeah, there's no reason not to fight for it or give it your best shot. And then if you fall down, hopefully you built a a net around you or people are aware of you enough to to help you out. But yeah, nobody's going to do the work for you. That's that's for sure. This is, it shares a lot of commonalities with fitness in the sense that you can be as motivated as 
it gets and have as much fluff in front of you and cheerleaders around you, but nobody literally can do the work for you. Um, there's, there's a lot of fitness stuff. So, um, I'm with it. I, I get it and I support it a hundred percent. And I don't think you're going to regret it because the only people that would really have exception to it are probably the ones that are defensive about it because they're not doing that work. And we're more or less calling them out on it, unfortunately, but that also is a rough part of being a person. You know, it's, it, it sucks. And it's another thing that's easy to say and difficult to have happen to you, but that's, that's a part of it, man. Yeah. Getting back to your original statement around my topic being a scary one or one that you don't like, um, growth is uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable in the, the growing process or the process of being a human, then you're probably not doing things correctly. Um, I think that just cruising through life, rose colored glasses, that is a, a, a false perspective. Um, you know, if you're not experiencing ups and downs and stressors, then I don't really know if you're existing or yeah. really living in a way that um, you might think that you are. Well, those are some of the scariest people. Like you think that people who are angry or lashing out are loud or scary, but it's the, the always happy people who are inflappable and smiling all the time, even through the worst stuff. Those are the people that scare me. So I agree. Those That's not a normal reaction to have uh, 100% up all the time. And, um, yeah. you know, we I work with a few guys like that who are always up and always on, but... I have seen them down and like honest before. And I know that w that what they're portraying is them um, putting on this show, like getting up, getting energy up, getting going. Everything's fine. This is a good day. Everything's great. But luckily um, I've seen them <laughs> be to drop the act a little bit and be a real person, which is comforting. Well, something that gets talked about a lot in mental health treatment is what are the masks that we wear? And why do we wear those masks? We wear those masks to protect ourselves or to keep ourselves safe. And I think there is a place for it. Like if I think about me as a social worker, if I'm doing therapy with someone and I'm struggling with, you know, my, let's say I'm going through a divorce, I'm not married. So this isn't a personal example, but let's say I'm a therapist going through a divorce and can't stop, you know, crying because I'm thinking about, you know, the dissolution of my marriage. Um, and I go into session with someone and I'm still just crying and crying and crying. That's not serving anyone any purpose or help. So it's important to wear that mask or put up that emotional armor and say, you know, I'm good for this next hour and I'm going to focus on this other person and everything's okay in my life because this isn't about me. But it's really important that you take off those masks every day, probably. Yeah, right. <laughs> I was about to say every once in every a while. Every six months, yeah. Yeah, maybe on a very <laughs> consistent and regular basis and really think about what am I feeling today and what's going on and what resolve those things or those problems that I'm experiencing. And that's how you keep behavioral health conditions or disorders at bay. Something I say all the time is, those people that are always talking about that's a problem for someone else or, yeah, I believe that PTSD is real or that depression is real, but that's never going to be me. Those are the people that I worry about the most because I tend to think that those are the ones that are much more susceptible to those conditions because they're not ever giving any awareness or recognition to the things that they're going through and then something traumatic happens, whether that's at work or at home or, you know, um, somewhere out living your life. And then you don't know what it is that you're experiencing. So the more knowledge that you have, the more awareness that you have to these things and buying into, we're all kind of one thing away from developing PTSD, whether you're a first responder or not is going to, I think set you up for success in dealing and processing with those things that come up that are stressful or traumatic, because then you know the importance of it. But if you're always saying that's going to be someone else, or that's a problem for that guy over there, not for me, then you're probably not attuning to your mental well-being, let alone your mental health. 
So do you think a lot of people who say that, do you, when you see them uh, after the fact, either at the center or, or the um, advanced recovery, were they, were they actually pulling like the superior superiority complex thing and saying that truthfully, like not going to pay attention to that because that's below me or, or that's not something I would deal with? Or were they saying that while they were going through it, but they were trying to deflect from, from people knowing that, like what, is there a commonality you've seen before that? Or is it just like case by case again? I think it's probably case by case, but in a generalized sort of sense, I'd say many of them probably think that, you know, I was stuffing it down, compartmentalizing because I just figured it would go away and it was, you know, something that would resolve on its own. Or maybe it was like true ignorance, maybe even a touch of arrogance of, no, it's never going to be me. And I never believed that it could be. Um, And then I think what ends up happening is this accumulation of stress and trauma over a 20, 30 year career. And then they get to the end of it, most oftentimes in retirement and are like, wow, now I have a lot of time to think about (laughs) all this stuff. And I wish I just would have thought about it as it happened. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like Tim Sears. And I don't feel like I'm speaking out of school because that was a, a bulk of our conversation. But that that's that's what he said was he he had a little meltdown in 2018. Um, his brain broke, as he said, and then uh, it kept getting worse. But he had a uh, he felt like he had a self imposed duty to act because COVID hit, and he felt an obligation to stay and and lead through that. Um, and then he retired, and that's when he like developed the plan to commit suicide and started thinking about it. And really, it became a, a thing once he realized he wasn't going back to work, that's when the wheels fell off. So, um, yeah, it sounds, I mean, it's, it's, it's tragically predictable in some cases Mm -hmm. if we just pay attention to, to what we're doing, you know? Right. I Um, mean, a a protective factor is mental health awareness and a risk factor is a lack of resources or engagement or utilization of those resources. So you can't really, the science or research, I guess, backs that. Um, and it's hard to deny, you know, statistics or research. Yeah, man. Okay. So one more thing, and we can, you can explain this to me if, if you want or not. Um, cause we'll do a wrap up afterwards, but why is nicotine so bad? Cause here's the thing. I always thought tobacco was bad and, mm-hmm. um, and I'm only asking this because there's a an influx now of nicotine products that are tobacco free. And the way it was explained to me was the tobacco is the bad stuff. So when you burn or process and make the tobacco and chew or cigarettes, that's where the cancer is in that um, burning process. But if you isolate the nicotine and have that as a standalone thing, it's got its own um, qualities, but it can be considered similar to caffeine, kind of a just a thing, right? Not necessarily damaging or harmful. Um, so when you were saying some of the risk factors and some of the, the modifiable factors towards these issues is the nicotine products. Is that for tobacco products that have nicotine or nicotine in general? Here's a blast from the past. I love chewing. Like it was one of my favorite things playing hockey, um, in the locker room. It was just a great thing. It was a social thing. It's not like, like social drinking. It was just one of those things that I tie back to a pretty fun time. I liked the way it made me feel. It was a bonding thing. Um, I still can't tell Katie, like, she's at, she's like, that's so gross, it's terrible, I'm like, but I, it was awesome, I loved it, and I miss <laughs> doing it, even though it's damaging, right, but now there's these, um, um, Zen packets that are just nicotine, from what I understand, and no tobacco, so it gives you a lot of the same of everything without what I consider to be the carcinogenic stuff, so I started trying them, I love them, because it's almost the same thing as when I was dipping, but without the stuff that I consider to be bad, so tell me why <laughs> can we say tobacco is bad and not nicotine or is it all bad? Well, I'm not an expert on tobacco or nicotine or smoking cessation, but what I can tell you is when you think about it's a hard one in behavioral health because a lot of people that admit to like a center of excellence or another residential treatment program, those nicotine products whether it's a chewing tobacco or smoking a cigarette or whatever it may be, that's the only thing they have left, especially when they're getting sober. Mm. And you think about the lesser of evils, 
it's kind of low on the priority list. Yeah. Um, let's get this person off heroin, off alcohol, off, off cocaine, whatever it is. Um, and sometimes, especially in like cigarette smoking, some of that deep breathing can be helpful for that person, especially when they're high experiencing high anxiety. So there might be some therapeutic purposes out there, but then you look on the flip side of that and the health risks that are involved. Um, and, you know, of course we want people to live the happiest, healthy, healthiest lives that they can. So as we're kind of chipping away at, you know, the other more critical uh, needs that someone has, it may get to the point of, okay, now let's do some behavioral modification around these nicotine or tobacco products. Um, so I'm not advocating for it one way or the other, but I know that there is a lot of discussion around, you know, why do you allow clients to use tobacco products at the center of excellence? And it's like, well, we are looking at some way more critical immediate <laughs> needs right. that someone has in terms of life or death. And so that's our wheelhouse. That's our scope. That's what we're going to focus on. We're going to talk about smoking cessation and we're going to talk about the health risks that are involved. But, um, you know, that's that's going to be for another day, essentially. Mm. Um, and then I, you know, I guess to maybe focus on a little bit more of what you brought up. Um, I think of it everything in terms of coping and what's the intention, what's the purpose. Um, are we utilizing tobacco or nicotine products in a moment of anxiety because I have no other coping mechanism? Mm -hmm. I would say that's probably a problem. Right. Let's think about some other skills that you innately possess or can cultivate uh, that can help you much greater than pulling out a cigarette could or whatever the product is. Yeah. Um, so I think you always have to look at the intention and, you know, if you use a, a lot more tobacco products when you're drinking alcohol, then why are you consuming alcohol at such a high rate? <laughs> you know? So right. it all kind of comes together. And I think it comes down to the person yeah. um, really looking at their own intention. So I don't know. I think you were looking for me to tell Katie one way or the other. And no, I, no, I told I her. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, think, I think it's very interesting. That I will say that's one spot where I'm highly um, aware of and sensitive to is like, if my brain says, man, I could really use a drink right now, like now my, that's a no. Like now you don't get one because you screwed that up. You told me the wrong thing. Now you don't get right. a drink. And uh, maybe some other time. Because I, I like I like drinking I like using the tobacco, uh, not tobacco, man, I'm back in my old head. I like using the nicotine stuff when I'm having a good time or when I'm doing something and I'm like, that'd be fun to have right now. Or like, that'd be nice to have. That's then I give myself like the permission to have it. But, um, yeah, I'm very aware of that. Like, man, I could use a drink right now, even coffee. If ever I'm like, man, I, I'm not one of those people who's like, don't talk to me before my morning coffee. I, I'm not, I can't function before that. I just, I don't know why I don't like that, but I feel like all these extra things should be um, helping you of some sort, but you shouldn't be basing your functioning on the outside things. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. And that's why I really like that question of what is my, my intention uh, that I'm looking for by engaging this behavior or utilizing this substance. Now, of course, if we're talking illicit drugs, so you're, there's never going to be, <laughs> right. you know, a, Oh, just because I want to go have fun. Yeah, I'm like, already having fun. I might as well, right? That's not what I'm saying. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm talking about things that are legal and within reason. Yeah. You know, what's the intention of usage? Oh, I like it. Thanks for thanks for humoring me with that because uh, um, it's just, I don't know, it's interesting. I like, But I like where that went to is the justification and the context around it, not necessarily the, the individual behavior. Um, yeah. I dig it. All right. Why don't you give um, your contact stuff where people can look up the whatever you want them to have um and we'll get you out of here sure so to find out more information on our webinars to register for those see what we've covered in the past find out more information on the center of excellence you can go to iaffrecoverycenter.com 
uh, my contact information is also listed in several places on the COE's website, but if anyone wanted to reach out to me about the program or those vetted clinician lists that we discussed or educational offerings, you know, that are free to you and your department or in your communities, just give me a call. My phone number is 240-357-4838. I would share my email, but it is miles long. Um, but I guess now I'll just share it since I said it. It's <laughs> Mo Jones at advanced recovery systems.com. So probably couldn't get longer, but anyone's welcome to reach out to me for whatever it may be. I'm always happy to help. And you travel, we talked about this before I started recording, you travel a lot. So you're very, yes. that's kind of your thing, right? So if someone's listening um, anywhere pretty much and they contact you, there's a good chance that you'll be able to get to them at least close. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we, we go all over, really have no kind of parameters. I mean, I guess if I was like, I'm going to Europe, they'd probably be like, why? <laughs> right. uh, but North America is definitely within our jurisdiction, I guess, or territory. Um, but in that same vein, probably is easier to text me or to email me because I am on an off airplane. So calling me might be difficult sometimes, but try to be as responsive as I can be. Right on. Well, thanks, Molly. This was a good, uh, a great second visit. Um, yeah. And I'm sure we'll have more in the future, but I'm looking forward to, to seeing you, hanging out with you on uh in South Bend, whenever whenever we're going to be there. I'll be there the 16th. Next week. Yeah, I'm working the 15th. Yes. I'll be there the 16th morning. Uh, so if you're still around, I'll see you then. I will certainly be there. I look forward to seeing you.